The planet Mars is the most obvious significator for aggression in the chart. And all of us have Mars in our charts. We're all born with Mars in the chart. I mean, I doubt if there's anybody here today who doesn't have Mars in their chart. <laughs> um, if you don't have Mars in your chart, will you please stand up? I mean, you wouldn't be able to stand up if you didn't have Mars in your chart. Um, so, if we're all born, if we agree that we all have Mars in the chart, then this means that we are all born with aggressive urges. To put it simply, aggression is innate. We are born with it in the same way as we are born with an innate sex drive. Sex serves a very obvious positive purpose to humanity. I mean, we wouldn't be here without it. So why shouldn't aggression, which is also a natural part of our biological makeup, also serve an important evolutionary purpose. And what I'm trying to say is that aggression must be there for some good reason. Mars must be in our chart for some good reason. And I'll be quite blatant about this. One of the, the purposes of this lecture is to encourage you to make friends with your Mars, to see this often maligned planet in a better light, and to encourage you to value the more positive aspects of aggression. There's a quote by an American psychologist. Her name is Clara Thompson. I've never read anything else she's written but this quote, <laughs> which <laughs> rather, um, I hope you can see it, I think, because it sums things up pretty nicely. She says that aggression is not necessarily destructive at all. It springs from an innate tendency to grow and master life, which is characteristic of all living matter. Only when this life force is obstructed in its development do ingredients of anger, rage, or hate become connected with it. I'll be coming back to that a bit more later. <laughs> Mars can really get out of hand sometimes. Um, and it can be expressed very negatively. Um, Mars can be used very clumsily. Uh, we see such deplorable form of aggression all around us in everyday life. People are maimed, tortured, murdered. Uh, they're subjected to all forms of physical and psychological cruelty. Uh, or aggression can be in turned inward. It can actually attack the self. It, it can attack the body. And it becomes a contributing factor in heart disease, stomach problems, skin ailments, sexual dysfunctions, things like that. While we detest these negative forms of aggression, we must bear in mind and honor the other face of aggression, our healthy, natural root aggression, which is laudable and which we must not disown if we are to survive, if we are to grow, if we are to master anything in life. So what does Mars give us? What does Mars bestow? Mars endows us with the will to unfold more of what we are or can become. The philosopher Paul Tillich once wrote, man's being is not only given to him, but also demanded of him. He is responsible for it. Man is asked to make of himself what he is supposed to become to fulfill his destiny. So our being is not only given to us, but required of us. We have to do something to fulfill it. Healthy aggression, as symbolized by Mars, is the way we make of ourselves what we are meant to become. If we deny Mars in ourselves because we're afraid of its more negative sides, then we are in danger of losing touch with that bit of us which wants to grow into what we are. And when this desire to grow when this desire to progress and move forward is blocked, and it can be blocked either by something external or by yourself, you can hold it back, then it turns angry. And what I'm trying to say is that uh, aggression is muscular. It, it's, it's the desire to move forward, the desire to express. And if aggression is blocked, either by 
something outside stopping it or by your own self holding it back, then it turns angry. In other words, anger can be understood as blocked movement. Healthy aggression is also the positive impulse to comprehend and master the external world. It's a force deep down inside which provides the impetus to learn new skills. Because you have aggression in you, because you have Mars in you, you can choose to read a book, to take care of your body, to attend a class, you can choose to say no or say yes. Even our language uh, is an, indicates our need for aggression. If you listen carefully to the language, the words we use, we attack a problem, we master a difficulty, we grapple with an issue, we contend with an issue, we're awarded a master's degree. Uh, you could have a very inspired artistic imagination, but if you didn't have Mars in your chart, you wouldn't be able to do anything about ordering the canvases or get around to picking up the paintbrushes. Dane Rijar once said that Mars is the force which propels the seed to germinate. Wherever Mars is operating in your chart is where these forms of healthy aggression can be exerting themselves. Really, the whole principle of Mars is very paradoxical. On the one hand, Mars impels us to act in ways which affirm our identity, which affirm our purpose. And yet it also give, gives rise to very deplorable forms of behavior. And this contrasting expression of Mars, or this contrasting expression of aggression, is shown quite clearly in mythology when you analyze how differently the god Mars was portrayed in Greek and Roman myth. And I didn't know this until I'd read some mythology, and I thought Mars was treated mostly the same in Greek and Roman myth. Then I was reading about it, and the Greeks and the Romans had entirely different views of Mars. And, and I'm going to go into this because it helps to explain the different ways Mars can express itself. In Greek mythology, the god of war is called Ares. This isn't necessarily to be, to be confused with Ares, the sign Ares. Uh, although Ares and uh, the Greek Ares and the sign Ares often do have a lot in common. And the Greeks thought very little of the mighty Ares. In fact, they, they hated him. Uh, he was looked down upon with a mixture of pity, of terror, and scorn. I mean, he was huge. He was, he was meant to be vast. He was like very big and very butch, but everyone looked down on him. Um, his role was extremely limited. He was simply the god of war and nothing else. And yet, for all his brutishness, for all his bloodthirsty violence, for all his blind courage, he was generally depicted as losing most of the battles he fought. Uh, he's often shown limping away, defeated and humiliated uh, from the battlefield. He's constantly tripping over his own feet and getting in his own way. If you read about him, uh, they, they make fun of him, they laugh at him. Uh, the Greeks didn't speak Yiddish. You know Yiddish. Yiddish is um, uh, the language spoken, well, predominantly by the, the Jewish people in Eastern Europe, although you can hear it in Golders Green and Stamford Hill and in New York a lot. It's a kind of, I think it's a combination of German and Hebrew. Uh, and had the Greeks spoken Yiddish, they, they would have had a perfect word for, the, for their, their Aries. They would have called him a klutz. Mm -hmm. Uh, they would have gone, oh God, what a klutz. And I'm not sure exactly how to interpret the word klutz or to describe it to you. It's kind of a clumsy twit who knocks things over a lot, spills soup on himself, uh, tea down his shirt, uh, and generally gets in his own way. Uh, it's a bit like uh, John Cleese's portrayal of Basil Fawlty in Faulty Towers. That's one of the images that come to mind when I think of a klutz. Uh, Zeus, who is the most honored of the gods in Greece, hated Ares. And in the Iliad, Homer quotes Zeus uh, talking to the god of war, talking to Ares. And this is what Zeus has to say. Of all the gods who live on Olympus, you are the most odious to me. You enjoy nothing but strife, war, and battle. You have the obstinate and unmanageable disposition of your mother Hera, 
whom I can scarcely control with my words. So he says, you're just like your mother. Uh, Zeus is the equivalent to the Roman god Jupiter. And astrologically, this quote reflects the Jupiterian principle speaking to the Mars principle. We can understand it as Jupiter looking at Mars. And normally we think of Jupiter and Mars as being quite compatible because Jupiter rules Sagittarius and Mars rules Aries and they're both part of the fire trinity. So you think they would get along. And yet on one level, Jupiter does look down upon Mars. Jupiter looks down upon the rash, impulsive nature of Aries. Uh, Jupiter is more the principle of logos, of mind. Jupiter sees an expanded vision. He, he, sees, he has a broad, broadened awareness, and then he acts uh, on the basis of that vision. He takes the bigger picture into account before he acts. This is Jupiter. Uh, whereas Mars just rushes in. Mars acts from a very self-centered, a very impetuous place. He acts from instinct, without much forethought, as opposed to Jupiter's kind of more expanded vision and that way of acting. In Greek mythology, Ares had two squires who accompanied him in battle, two escorts who came with him in battle. And one was Deimos, whose name means fair. And the other was Phobos, whose name means fright. So fair and fright accompanied the Greek Mars. I think it's worthwhile reflecting a bit on the relationship between fair and anger. Sometimes we, we get angry or we get aggressive because we're frightened. There was some study done that if an animal was frightened, it sent out a kind of odor that made other animals want to attack it. So if you're fearful in yourself, you may, att you may actually attract people who want to be, uh, put you down or be aggressive towards you. Somehow people pick up that you're sending something out. Aries, the Greek Aries was also accompanied by Eris, whose name means strife, and by a group called the Keres, who enjoyed drinking the black blood of the dying. So we have fear and fright, strife, and this, these people who drank the black blood of the dying. Um, a very jolly band, indeed. Uh, I wouldn't want to run into them late at night. Um, but these are the Greek associations with the Mars principle. Now, Ares had a sister, Athene. Athene is more a Libran principle. She represents cool intelligence. And Zeus adored Athene. So he adored Athene and hated Ares. So we get a kind of archetypal sibling rivalry going on. And in fact, Athene was born fully grown from the head of Zeus. What happened was that Hera was so enraged that Zeus had given birth to Athene without her, that she decided to get her own back, and she contrived to give Ares, to give birth to Ares without intercourse with Zeus. And so Ares is born of revenge and retaliation. Ares is the product of the rage stored up in Hera's body. And we store rage up in our body, and if we store rage up in our body, eventually it explodes. In any house containing Mars, there's a kind of storage tank which can only take so much of stuff being held in it before the storage tank gets so full that it will blow. And when it comes out, it will cause a much bigger mess than you might even have intended. I've noticed this dynamic of rage getting stored up in the body. Uh, in the charts of people born with Mars in hard aspect to the moon, I think other aspects give it, but I know it in terms of Mars square to the moon or Mar Mars in hard angle to the moon. What I've noticed about these people, see the, the moon has to do with feelings, and Mars will heat up whatever it touches. So if you have Mars in aspect to the moon, then it heats up the feelings. It causes quick reactions. And the body will react to a threat, when, with Mars squared moon or Mars in hard angle to the moon, the body instinctively reacts to a threat and mobilizes itself into anger even before you have a chance to reason or rationalize the situation. Before you know it, something blurts out. Before you have a chance to 
think about what you're doing. One time, Ares and Athene are having an argument. And Ares gets very angry and he rushes towards Athene. He's blazing with passionate intensity. He's so mad. And my picture of Athene is that Ares is coming at her and she's very cool. And she's kind of reclining there. She's reading a book or maybe she's doing her nails. And she looks up and she sees Ares rushing towards her. And she very coolly puts down her book or puts down her nail file. And she picks up a stone, which happens to be handy, and she just throws it at him and it hits him and he falls down. <laughs> um, and according to the story, he, 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 uh, he falls down, he covers an expanse of seven acres and he screams like 10,000 men. And uh, he kind of ends up flat on his back, a bit like a turtle turned over, or screaming baby is another image that comes to mind. He's flat on his back and he's, he's flailing his arms and legs, and he just throws a tantrum uh, because Athene has beat him. And the kind of anger the Greeks associated with Ares, is, it's very uncool. It's the kind of anger that uh, you hardly ever score your point when you go into that kind of rage. Uh, it's the kind of anger you feel when you, when you, think you're, when you feel like you're just going to vibrate out of existence. Sometimes I have that. It's, you just get so angry, it's like you're going to just go out of the planet, go into orbit. And uh, you shout and scream and carry on and, and, and make an absolute fool of yourself, and invariably you lose. You don't win, because you've just gone so over the top. In another story, Ares is captured by two ordinary mortals, and he's, he's trapped in a bottle for 13 months. Uh, in a similar fashion, we bottle up our Martian energy. And you can imagine how Ares felt when he was finally released. The Greek root of the word Ares stems from a word which means to be carried away or to destroy. And this is what Ares is about. He gets carried away and he's very destructive. Now, I want to compare this with the Roman equivalent, Mars, to compare how the Greeks saw their god of war and how the Romans saw Mars. Mars commanded a, a quite a high position in the Roman pantheon. In fact, he, was, he commanded a higher position than that of Jupiter. So it's just the reverse of the Greek situation. In the Greek situation, Zeus was much higher than Ares. But in the Roman, Mars assumed a more important position than Jupiter. Uh, he had a very elevated position in Roman myth. In fact, the Roman Mars was considered to be the father of Romulus and Remus, who are the founders of Rome. In other words, Mars was one of the principles upon which Rome was founded. The Romans thought there was something much more positive about Mars than just the expression of blind, explosive, indiscriminate rage. In Roman myth, Mars's role as the god of war was actually secondary to other functions. He was not pr primarily just the god of war, like in Greek mythology. In Rome, Mars was also a god of agriculture. And he was often pictured quite contented, sitting with his cows in the field, which is not an image you normally have of Mars. He was also the god of spring and the god of vegetation. So to the Romans, Mars was associated with fertility, with spring, with growth, with growing, with becoming, with unfolding. And the origin of the Roman name Mars, the origin is actually disputed, but it may come from the root mas, M-A-S, which means the generative force, the generative force, or from the root mar, M-A-R, which means to shine. He was also called Mars Grandivis, from the word grandiri, which means to become big and to grow. So we have the generative force, we have to shine, we have to become big, we have to grow. So different from the uh, Greek root of Ares, which simply meant to be carried away or to destroy. The, 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 the difference is quite striking in how, these different, how differently they saw this principle. Remember I said that fear and fright were the squires to the Greek Ares? 
the Roman Mars had two very different escorts. Anos, which meant honor, and virtus, which meant virtue. So the Roman Mars was accompanied by honor and virtue. The, uh, it is honorable to stand your ground, to value who you are, to grow into that which you are meant to become. It is virtuous to realize your destiny, to be true to your destiny. Now, it gets a little tricky here because the Romans believed that it was their destiny to rule the world. And they believed that it was their destiny to bring the law to bear on the world. So for them, asserting themselves was honorable and virtuous because it meant being true to what they believed was their destiny and purpose. Negative, negatively, of course, the, the Roman Mars could be used to validate chopping an enemy's head off. But more positively, the principle stands for, the, the Mars principle stands for unfolding and honoring who you are. I want to apply this more directly to the chart. We have, we have the Greek Aries, this destructive blind aggression, and we have the Roman Mars, which is a way of affirming your individual existence standing up for yourself. And we can apply it to the chart by, by considering the house position of Mars in the chart. That's one way we can look at it. So if you can think about your house position of Mars, is it operating like the Greek Aries or the Roman Mars in that domain of life? Uh, sometimes it can be a, a combination of the two. They can be intertwined. Uh, for instance, the adolescent boy who's rebelling against authority may do it in a very obnoxious way and so he may rebel in a kind of Greek Aries way and yet what he is doing is he's doing something quite honorable in the sense that he's manifesting a very healthy drive for independence a drive to be someone in his own right and sometimes to be independent means you have to kick against somebody you have to take a stand against somebody so he can do it a very honorable thing and yet he can do it in a way which is obnoxious. So it can be a combination of the two. But let's play around with this for a minute. Um, take the second house, which is commonly called the house of money, possessions, values, and resources. Yeah? How would the Greek Ares go after money? Okay. Sort of picture him on the first day of the Herod's sale, okay, trying to get a sense of his principle on that day. Um, my image of him is something, well, his mentality would be, you know, I want when I want, what I want when I want it. A sort of give me, bring me, buy me, take me type mentality. Um, what about the Roman Mars, though? What, how, how would it be in the second house? I think the Roman Mars <clears throat> would see earning money and acquiring possessions as a way of affirming who he is in a way of realizing a sense of power, a sense of purpose. He would get a sense of his identity by being able to earn money, by being able to master the material world. It may, he may, maybe will even feel that one of his purposes for being here is to become more adept at dealing with the material world or handling finances or getting what he wants. Uh, when you have a planet in a house, it, it, it shows what you meet in that area of life and how you color that area of life. <clears throat> For instance, if you have the moon in the second house, in the house of money and possessions, then the moon will color that house. And uh, uh, acquiring money or possessions may give you a sense of comfort, a sense of security, because the moon is there. Wherever the moon is, is where we're looking for mother. We're looking for the security we had with mother. And if it's in the second house, then uh, money or having possessions would give us that kind of security that we once had or should have had with our mother. Gives us a sense of comfort. Or if you have the moon in the second, you might be uh, attracted to something. You might want to own something because of its emotional significance for you. Uh, maybe it has a sentimental significance. Uh, and it makes you, it reminds you of something that you enjoyed doing or you enjoy, uh, you enjoy the experience of. So you like to have it. Whereas, and I want to compare that with the way Mars is. You see, with the moon, we get a sense of security or comfort from money or possessions. But with Mars, you get a sense of power. You get a sense of your masculinity, if you like. You get a sense of your, your worth, uh, of your identity by what you have. 
It's quite different. What about the sixth house? Uh, the sixth house has a lot to do with uh, how we approach uh, daily ritual. It's, it's the, the, the mundane necessities of everyday life, how you deal with the milkman or with your car mechanic. Um, it's also a lot about how we approach a job, the way we work. The sixth house has a lot to do with, with just the way we work. The tenth house is more how we like to be seen working. The sixth house is more how we work when we're alone, our, our, our way of approaching a job. So I was thinking, how would the Greek Aries approach a job? And how would the Roman Mars approach a job? I mean, picture them doing the housework, if you like. Uh, the Greek Aries doing the housework, rushing into daily chores, not, I imagine knocking over things, missing corners, uh, kicking the dog, the sixth house has to do with pets, um, having a fit if the vacuum cleaner broke, all that impetuosity in that area of life, all that impulsiveness. Uh, his motto might be, if, if there's a job worth doing, it's worth doing in a hurry. Uh, but compare this with the Roman Mars. If you had Mars in the sixth, and it was operating like the Roman Mars, how would that be? And again, I think the Roman Mars uh, would see work primarily as a way of defining or expressing himself. He would take pride in the details of his work because he would feel that every little thing he did was a reflection of his identity. So if he was writing something and he forgot to dot an I or cross a T, it would be quite upsetting to the Roman Mars because everything he does reflects him. And if there's something askew in what he's doing, then that would mean there was something askew in him. Honor and virtue accompany the Roman Mars, not fair and fright. So the Roman Mars would get a sense of pride, a sense of honor from his work. You can play around with some of these things yourself, and, and I do talk about them in the book. I want to move on to the aspects to Mars, to talk a little bit about Mars in terms of aspect. Uh, I don't have much to say about the sign placement of Mars because I, I think it's fairly obvious and I have to keep, I've had to cut down a lot in this lecture. Uh, but the sign placement of Mars tells us a lot about the way a person asserts. I've always seen uh, planets as, as verbs. The, the planets tell what kind of action is going on. But the signs are a bit like adverbs. They describe the way that action is done. So Mars and Taurus uh, may do the Mars in a Taurian way. Uh, when it asserts, it may be slow to get started, because Taurus is not a, uh, a fast sign. So Mars and Taurus may be slow to get started, but once it gets going, it's very determined, and very hard to stop. Uh, Mars and Gemini will do Mars in a Geminian way, which means that it may spend a lot of time sort of thinking about which thing to do first. And it may start doing one thing and then be lured off into another. Mars in the watery sign of cancer uh, will tend to assert more covertly or uh, with more indirectly, because cancer is not a direct sign. You know, the crab approaches things sideways. So Mars in cancer may assert more indirectly than, let's say, Mars in Leo, which asserts in a very dramatic a very proud way. Uh, uh, Mars and Leo is very proud of what it has to do. It, it, it kind of dramatizes what it's, whatever it's doing. It's very important. But aspects to Mars tell us more about the way a person asserts. Aspects to Mars tell us what comes up for a person when he starts to assert or when the person starts to, to express themselves. Uh, one way that's always helped me to understand aspects is to picture an aspect between two planets, like a, a table with two legs. And if you pull one leg, you get the other one coming along. So if you have Mars in aspect to Neptune, Mars making an angle to Neptune, if you do Mars, you pull Neptune along. Neptune comes along with Mars. 
So using that example, if you have Mars in aspect to Neptune, then when you assert, you will assert in a Neptunian way. Maybe you will assert with a great deal of sensitivity, because Neptune is very sensitive. Or you may be secret about your assertion. Or you may, Neptune is fog and mist, so you may be confused about how to assert. Uh, or you may dream a lot about asserting and never do it. Okay, all those things come up when you think about Mars in relationship to Neptune. The other thing about a planet in aspect to Mars is it does suggest some of the things a person might do to affirm the identity. Some of the ways a person might affirm his or her identity. So if Mars is an aspect to Neptune, then it may be through doing something Neptunian that you get a sense of your power, that you get a sense of your uh, identity. So if Mars were an aspect to Neptune, then uh, doing something Neptunian would give you a sense of your identity. Maybe it would be playing music would give you a sense of your power or a sense of who you are, a way of affirming yourself. Uh, doing a dance may be a way of affirming yourself. Or Neptune has to do with healing, so being a healer may be a way of getting an identity. Uh, Neptune's also the victim as well. So someone with Mars and aspect to Neptune may actually get their sense of who they are by being a victim, by uh, being weak, being helpless. Whatever... Um, uh, when, when Neptune touches something, it often makes us want to give that principle away. So if Neptune's an aspect to Mars, there's a tendency to want to give Mars away, to get other people to tell us what to do, to get other people to act out our Mars. The other thing that Neptune Mars does is, uh, Mars wants to act, but Neptune says you should take others into consideration, you're part of something bigger. So often it acts for the sake of others, it doesn't just act for itself. It does, thing be, it does something because it feels that the greater whole or something other than themselves needs it. Those are just the different ways. You can do that with all the planets. I wanted to talk about Mars and aspect to Jupiter, though, with you, just to amplify in that one a bit. When I was reading Charles Carter, uh, he, uh, in his book, Astrological Aspects, which is, a, which is one of the classic books on aspects, and, and has many, many good ideas, uh, I was reading about Mars-Jupiter there and what he did say was he thought that the inharmonious aspects of Mars to Jupiter were in his opinion the very worst aspects that you could have. <laughs> so um, I thought we could look at it a bit more and see what he meant by this and also try to see something maybe more constructive or, or why, 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 why he said that, what was that about. Um, Jupiter tends to inflate or expand whatever it touches. So, if it's an aspect to Mars, then it will overdo or expand the Mars principle. On the positive side, if Jupiter is an aspect to Mars, there's a kind of enthusiasm to assert, an enthusiasm to grow, an enthusiasm to express yourself, because Jupiter has a lot to do with enthusiasm, with uh, uh, broadening your horizons, with going farther and faster. But when you have the hard aspects between Mars and Jupiter, what you get is a problem with proportion. The person gets excited and wants to assert Mars, but they do it in a way which is over the top, or which is excessive. So they find something that they, they want to promote or they want to do and they get kind of carried away with it. They, they overkill. They overpromote. And so they, they try to sell it to you but they do it in such a manner that you're almost put off because it comes over too strong, it comes over too big. Or they find something which turns them on and they get so excited about it that they think that uh, everyone should do it. It's, you know, some, they, they find something they enjoy and they think everyone will enjoy it. Or they find a, uh, something they believe in, they think this will work for everyone. And I think what they believe in may be, may be very true, may be very beautiful, but they can drive other people away because of the manner in which they do it. So uh, doors sometimes close in their face because of their over-assertive manner or going over the top of what they're doing. I was uh, 
interested in finding uh, Mars in aspect of Jupiter in the chart of John McEnroe, <laughs> among others. Uh, Mars is actually very... Can you see that? Yeah. Mars is very important in his chart because it's the focus for many aspects. It's in a, a grand cross in the chart. And we have this Mars opposition Jupiter and it's, it's absolutely true that when he asserts, he goes over the top with it. it it's, uh, he goes quite far with his Mars. Uh, the other thing is that, remember I said that whatever planet touches Mars, often we affirm our identity through that planet. And Jupiter has a lot to do with sporty. Jupiter has a lot of sporty connotations. And so one way he can affirm his identity, Mars, is through Jupiter, is through being a sportsman. Uh, the other thing I've noticed about Mars-Jupiter aspects is that when they assert, they sometimes think they're doing it on the basis of a higher authority. Um, <laughs> Jupiter uh, was, at least in, in Greek mythology, Zeus, was the king of the gods. He was the highest authority. And so if you have Mars in aspect to Jupiter, there's a way of thinking, I'm acting because I've seen the truth, I've seen the big picture, I have it on God, I have it on the scriptures, uh, I, I, I have it on some sort of higher authority. And uh, when, he, when he fights with the umpires, uh, it's like he has this, he, he, he is presenting something, he says, I have it on a higher authority, I've seen the truth and you have it. Uh, the other thing which I'm going to talk a little bit more about later, is the fact that he has the moon conjunct Mars in the eighth house and it's squared to Pluto. Do you see that? Moon, Mars, and Gemini in the eighth, squared Pluto and Virgo in the eleventh, the house of groups and associations. And the, what, what, Pluto, has, Pluto, and also the eighth house, has a lot to do with what is buried in us. Pluto was the god of the underworld, the god of what's kind of down here, what's deep inside us, what's there from the past. And if Mars is in the eighth, or Mars is an aspect of Pluto, then I think our anger, like his immediate anger at the umpire, or his, his immediate anger at the whole Wimbledon establishment, gets mixed up with a deeper rage, a more infantile rage, an older rage, a more Plutonic anger. Uh, I think it gets mixed up with unfinished rage from childhood because the moon has a lot to do with your relationship with mother or with your early home life. And if you look at the early progressions to Mars, at a, quite a young age, it, it's, it squares the Pluto. If you do the secondary progressions, it squares the Pluto and comes up to the moon. So it suggests at a very early age, Mars would have triggered his moon Pluto. Uh, uh, and I think he has a kind of anger, which, which I would call id anger, I-D. And id anger is the anger of the infant. Uh, and this anger gets mixed up with his present anger, tinges his present anger. You see, when we're a baby, we're, we're born a potential victim, we're born pretty helpless. And unless there's someone there to look after us, we're going to die. And so, when you're four months old, and you're lying flat on your back in the crib, or in your cot, and you're hungry, and you start to scream for mother to come, and she doesn't come, you're not kind of, you don't have enough cerebralness, you're not rational enough yet to stop and think, well, mother's busy, or mother had a hard life, or mother's having problems with father, that's why she's not coming. You can't reason like that. All you're thinking is, my God, I'm starving, mother's not coming, I'm going to die. And, and so, id anger is the kind of anger that comes up when your survival depends on it. It's a kind of global anger. And I associate it, it's one of the things I associate with Mars-Pluto aspects, or Mars in the eighth. It brings up a deeper anger, an earlier anger, a primal rage. And what happens is that when we're very young and we have that rage, it feels terribly uncomfortable, and so we cut off from it. We're afraid to express it. It's very destructive. 
and we're, we're, we're afraid that if we have this rage, we might destroy mother, and she's the one we need to survive. So we have to cut out from it, cut off from it. And so, really, all of us, because at some point we would have been frustrated by mother and father, all of us have some unexpressed rage from childhood in us. And because we don't like it in ourselves, we don't like it when we see it brought up, when another person expresses it, we don't like to see it. We back off, we put that down. So when McEnroe gets mad at the umpire, and, it, and it's a, a kind of immediate situation, but it triggers this deeper id anger, as if his survival depended on it, and he gets that angry, he becomes like the Greek Ares. He may have a very good point, but as soon as it gets mixed up with the id anger, people don't like it. People put him down, people call him a brat, which is what you might call a baby, who cried a lot as well. Just for the sake of comparison, let's, let's compare Mars-Jupiter ties with Mars-Saturn aspects. While Jupiter is the problem of overexpanding or going over the top, Saturn brings in the idea of limitation, the idea of hesitation, the idea of holding back. When Mars wants to assert, Jupiter says, okay, yes, do it in a big way. But in the case of Saturn, when Mars wants to assert, Saturn says, hold on, take it easy, are you sure, are you good enough, is it allowed, what would your mother say? Uh, my, my image is Saturn kind of sitting on Mars's shoulder, if you have a Mars-Saturn contact, it's like Saturn sitting on Mars's shoulder, kind of judging it, inhibiting it, checking it. But there's an interesting twist here, and, and, uh, and Charles Carter does bring this out in his books. Some people with Mars in aspect to Saturn may worry so much about their ability to assert that they compensate because of their insecurity, and they work very hard at becoming good at asserting. They, they, Saturn, wherever Saturn is, is where we have something to learn, where we're being tested. So if it's an aspect to, to Mars, then there's something to learn about assertion. The German poet Goethe, Goethe was born with Saturn rising and Mars in Capricorn, so he had Mars in the Saturnian sign of Capricorn. And Goethe once wrote that it is in limitation that the master first shows himself. It is in limitation that the master first shows himself. So where we are limited, where we feel Inadequate is often where we, where we can become the most masterful. Okay, right now what I want to do is I want to take a different tack. And I, I've been fairly basic up to now. Uh, uh, and really, I, I want to go a little deeper in discussing some, some other significance or some other questions that Mars brings up. Mars is the will of the heroic ego. It's, Mars is the ability to assert what we want. Mars is the capacity to go out and get what we want. It's the personal will. But Jung, C.G. Jung has written that there are higher things than the ego's will, and to these we must bow. So he says there's something higher than the will of the ego. There's something higher than Mars. There's something higher than the personal will. And his quote suggests that our individual or personal will can either act in accordance with a higher will or fight against some higher will. I have to get slightly philosophical here. I, I believe that we all have a deeper core self, which guides, unfolds, regulates, oversees our development. It, it's uh, as if uh, there's something in us that wants to unfold. There's a deeper self which is trying, uh, which oversees our development, which wants to unfold itself. Saint Augustine once said, there is a self inside me, there is one inside me who is more myself than myself. <clears throat> 
just as an apple seed knows that it is meant to grow into an apple, there is a part of us which knows what it is meant to become. An apple seed knows it's meant to be an apple. It, it doesn't become a pear. Okay? Uh, it can try to become a pear, but it won't. So I think there's some deep part of us that knows, just as the apple seed knows what it's meant to become, there's some deep part of us which knows what we're meant to become. And I think this is what is meant by individuation, by words like self-realization and self-fulfillment. It means growing into what you are meant to become. And one of the problems with Mars is that our personal ego will may or may not be aligned with what our deeper core self wants for us. Do you see what I mean? That we have a personal will which may want something, but a deeper core self which may have something else in mind. Mars makes choices to assert who we are, but the big question is whether or not the choices Mars makes are in tune with the innate identity and purpose we are meant to unfold. Eastern philosophy uses the word dharma. You're probably familiar with this word. And by dharma, they mean the intrinsic identity which is present from birth inside us that we have to fulfill. Arist Aristotle also talked of this. He talked about something called entelechy, the full blossoming of something in potential. He talked about essence, that we had an essence we had to be true to. And the Eastern philosophers use dharma. It is the dharma of a fly to buzz, the dharma of fire to burn, the dharma of a lion to roar. And I believe that Mars, ultimately, is the active agent of the psyche. It's an active component of the psyche, which gives us the energy and the will to fulfill our dharma. That Mars is there to help us fulfill our dharma, to help us act it out, to help us express who we are, to help us assert our truth, the truth of our identity. But there is the danger and there is the possibility that Mars may try to run the show himself. That our individual ego may want something which is out of line with what is our dharma or what our deeper core self wants for us. In other words, instead of buzzing, the fly may try to roar. Or instead of roaring, the lion may just buzz. Really, I've seen that a lot. People come who are afraid of their own power. They're not being true to the power in their chart. You get people coming, six planets in fire, sun conjunct Mars in the first house in Leo, and they're so meek. You, know, you ask them if they want a cup of tea, and they say, well, are you making one? I'm, you know. And <laughs> they're not owning. You, know, you should really feel their presence. And they're, they're, they're buzzing when they should be roaring. Uh, I mean, I, people, it's nice for people to be polite, but you can be so polite that you can put your Mars out of work. I think that this conflict between what you want for yourself versus what the deeper self has in mind for you will show up most clearly with Mars in hard aspect to the outer planets. Uh, I, I believe that the power of the outer planets supersede the power of Mars. They suggest, the outer planets suggest there are forces at work which in the end want to bring Mars into line, that want to bend Mars to what they require that want to force Mars to his knees. I want to look a little more closely at this. If you take uh, Mars-Pluto aspects, if you have Mars and aspects of Pluto, there's lots of different ways. I mean, we, we could talk for days about Mars and aspect of Pluto. I want to look at it in a certain angle now. If Mars is an aspect of Pluto, then Mars will have to bow to the will of Pluto. And one way to understand Pluto is that Pluto is the inexorable force which propels history. Pluto is a force which compels us to die as a child and be reborn in adolescence. It's the force which compels us to die as an adolescent and emerge as an adult, although some of us try hard not to do it. Um, Pluto represents the inexorable wending on of life. It's the death of one phase and the birth of a new one, whether we want it or not. Pluto happens whether we like it or not. 
I may not want to go through puberty, okay? but there's no way I can stop going through puberty unless I kill myself. So I have to bend my will to something higher. Mars may keenly want a particular job or a particular relationship. You may want this job, this relationship, with, with all you know, your will. But Pluto may have something else in mind for you. Pluto might say, I think not getting that job or relationship offers you more what you need. I think not getting it is more in line with you developing certain qualities which you wouldn't develop if you just got what you wanted. Mars cries, Mars cries back, what's going on? I mean, I've done my assertiveness training, I've done the S course, <laughs> you know, and I'm still not getting what I want. You know, go on and do more S trainings. You know, your, your ego can choose something it wants, but if it's not in line with the will of the deeper self, you, 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 you may not get it. And if you do, you probably discover that it's not all you thought it would be. You recognize this issue. It happens to everyone, even if you don't have Mars in difficult aspect to Pluto or the outer planet. I've seen it most clearly with Mars in hard aspect to Pluto, also with Mars in hard aspect to Neptune. Neptune also sometimes asks that we give up our personal will for the sake of something higher. Uh, Neptune brings us to our knees. It makes us sacrifice things. Mars sometimes reacts to Pluto or Neptune by trying to push harder to get what it wants. You know, Mars-Pluto has an aspect, uh, Mars-Pluto uh, aspects have a kind of reputation for being quite ruthless. Because it, if you're fighting cosmic law, and you really have to fight very hard. Um, Isabel Hickey used to say, she was m my first astrology teacher in Boston, she used to say, you can try to break a cosmic law, but you'll break your neck doing it. Um, Mars can try to turn its will into law, but it's, it's, it's like trying to jump out of a 10-story window to defy gravity. You know, it just doesn't work. Um, I think the same dilemma is there if you have Mars trine or sextile Pluto. But people with Mars in a flowing aspect to Pluto seem to more quickly or more easily align their will to the higher will or the will of the self. Uh, so Pluto, may, Pluto or the deeper self may be saying you, sh you can't have a relationship right now because you need to grow in other ways. And if you have Mars sextile or trying Pluto, your Mars may be thinking, gee, you know, it would be good to go solo for a while and see what it's like. In other words, with the more flowing aspects between Mars and Pluto or Mars and Neptune, there is more likelihood that you'll flow with the way your core self wants you to flow. Uh, your, your feeling flows into your fate. You're reconciled with events. Jung also wrote that free will is the ability to do gladly that which I must do. How are we doing here for time? How long have I been talking now? Too long? An hour? <laughs> I guess it feels like it to you. I don't know. <laughs> Hmm? Let me carry on a bit. I, um, besides ena enabling us to make choices to be who we are, healthy aggression is also the basis for achieving independence and breaking away from people who would dominate us or overprotect us. Uh, so it enables us to become more independent. And you're familiar, you're, you're all familiar with the story of Hansel and Gretel. But have you ever paused to reflect on what it might mean psychologically? And it throws light on another quality to Mars. In the fairy tale, the mother sends Hansel and Gretel away because she cannot provide for them. She cannot adequately meet their needs. And then they meet this witch with the house of gingerbread. The witch is the one who has everything. She's the one with all the goodies. And yet she is the one who threatens most to destroy him, to destroy them, to destroy the children. The mother who forces them to fend for themselves, she's not the witch. 
But the one who provides everything for them, she's the really dangerous one. And what this means is that if someone is always looking after you, someone is providing you with everything, someone is making decisions for you, someone's telling you what to do all the time, then they keep you small. Uh, you never become a person in your own right. And we need Mars to combat this. We need Mars to assert our individuality. I think it's not just the fact that someone out there may stop you. It's an internal dilemma. Because there's one part of us that, that maybe wants to stay fused, that wants to be swallowed up in another. If you take the principles of the Moon, and the principles of Venus, and the principles of Neptune, these principles have a lot more to do with merging, with fusing, with blending, with losing yourself in someone else. And if you have any of these in aspect to Mars, especially in hard aspect to Mars, you have a conflict between one bit of you, Mars, which wants to become an individual in your own right, which wants power, which wants to assert, and another part of you which wants to blend or merge or fuse. Okay, I'm, I have more to say, but I, I want to draw to a close now, because it's, it's 8.30 at night is really a wonderful time to begin a lecture, especially for me. And I, wanted, I want to share something that um, I've been working on or thinking about in the last year, which is related very much to this topic. <clears throat> and because I, I think there are times when it is inevitable that we'll feel aggression, we'll feel angry, that our Mars will be blocked. And it's not always lawful or appropriate to express your aggression. There's a book called What We May Be by Piero Ferrucci, which I think is available on the bookstall. And in the book, he talks about ways of transforming aggression. Uh, uh, you know, hitting a pillow or writing an angry letter and not mailing it or drawing out your aggression, and, and they're very good ways. Um, I want to add something to that, because I'm not condoning going out and getting out your anger whenever it's there, getting out your aggression, because sometimes, you know, if you let it out, you, you will destroy more than you want, and, and some angry words can really cloud a relationship for a long time. And I've been working a lot with the idea in the last year that life can be lived on three different levels. The head, the heart, and the belly. To explain this, con consider this situation. Let's say that you've been waiting to meet somebody. And you've been waiting an hour and a half and they don't show up. Okay, you're stood up and you really wanted to see them and it's raining. <laughs> you can relate to that situation either from the head, the heart, or the belly. Okay, if you're coming from the head, then you'll probably try to figure out what's going on. So you may check your diary to see if you got the right time or the right place. Uh, you try to find some sort of framework through which to understand what's happening. You try to give it meaning. Uh, the head may, may, may even start to think, well, maybe the cosmos intends that I'm meant to do something else tonight. That's why the person didn't show up. Okay. It, it puts it in a framework which makes it understandable and you can, you can grasp it, you can, you, you can deal with it. Uh, and I think head energy is very much shown uh, by signs like Gemini, Aquarius, Libra, cerebral signs. They try to figure things out. They try to put something in perspective. Sagittarius is quite heady. Um, uh, even Virgo. Virgo is a funny combination of head and belly, but it tries to figure things out. Capricorn also is a combination of head and belly. Um, Capricorn feels things very instinctively, but tries to kind of hold them back, tries to understand them. 
Um, okay, now let's say, let's go to the heart level. Let's say that you've been waiting for somebody and it's an hour and a half and they haven't shown up and you really wanted to meet them. What's going on in your heart? What's going on right here? You can relate this to the chakras. We have the, the head chakras are kind of up here. The heart is more here and the belly is down here. And in your heart, you, you may feel sad. Okay? So there may be a sense of, gee, I'm really, you know, I'm really sad. I wanted to see them uh, and now they haven't come. Or you may even start thinking, gee, I hope they're okay. You, know, you start to worry about them. Did they get in an accident? And uh, wouldn't it be terrible if they got in an accident coming to see me? I, I would have caused it. You know, the heart starts to, um, it, it, it's open to things. It, 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 it kind of relates universally to things. Or you, the, the, the heart may feel so sad that you go home and you write a poem about the experience. How poignant, you know, two ships passing in the night. <laughs> And it kind of universalizes its feelings. It, it, and, and it may even rather enjoy it. Um, you know, like enjoying a good wallow, enjoying the poignancy of it all. It, it, it's you know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, another way of dealing with the situation, really. The, the heart is more Pisces. Cancer is a, is a heart. Cancer is another one that's a bit bellyish and also a bit heart. Uh, Leo, I think, has, has quite a bit of heart. Those, those tend to be heart, heart signs. So I don't want to fix it too closely. Okay, but what's going on in your belly? Okay. <laughs> what's going on in your gut? Right. It's an hour and a half. It's pouring. You were looking forward to seeing the person. They stood you up. What does it feel like? What's your instinctive response to that? Not your kind of understanding or your feel, but your instinctive response. And for me, uh, my belly gets very churned up, very agitated. Okay, and and it's I can't help it. It's a, it's a gut response. And no matter what else is going on, it's still there. The body has its response. And uh, belly signs are Scorpio is a good belly sign. Aries. I know that it's meant to be associated with the head, but really. <laughs> it's, a, it's a gut instinctive sign. Uh, Taurus, as well, is a belly sign. I think Capricorn is, but as I said, it's trying to be <laughs> up here about it. Uh, and the things that are going on in the belly, uh, the feelings you may get is like, I hate them, I'll kill them. <laughs> How could they do this to me? Wait till, you know, you're plotting your revenge, you know, when you see them. Um, and what happens in the belly is that it may actually start to, to process, to bring up other times in your life that you've been stood up or you've been let down. You may even start kind of, you're not necessarily conscious of it, but the feelings that are coming up, your instinctive response is from earlier in life as well, from when you were four months old and you were flat on your back in the cot and your mother didn't come and she let you down. Okay? And, and then it was really a problem. Okay? <laughs> You could, you could deal with it all right now. Your life doesn't depend on it. But then you thought your life did. So you can imagine what, you, what your instinctive response was. And um, so the belly is a bit ahistorical. Okay, it, uh, that that four-month-old infant is still alive in all of us. Okay? And if someone lets you down in the present, it can trigger that four-month-old infant coming up. It can trigger the screaming infant. I mean, I've known examples of people who flunk their driving test and have a nervous breakdown mm -hmm. or commit suicide. I mean, flunking the driving test is no reason to commit. It obviously brings up something very deep about failure or about not being good enough, which is older. Okay. Now, I think what happens is a lot of us try to use our head to hold down the belly. We try to understand something, to figure something out, as a way of, of kind of keeping the belly feelings down there. Uh, I think some people are too much in their belly. Some people will go into gut instinctive responses. I remember in San Francisco, I lived in a, an, in a hotel with, with 12 go-go dancers. They, they, were, <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they were all Scorpio. They were, they were uh, Scorpio topless dancers. And they were, always, they were always murdering each other and things like that, threatening. Anytime someone did something that upset them, they were going to kill them. So sometimes, 
you, people can be too much in their belly and maybe need to get a little objective and a little more understanding and why am I attracting this and what's going on and how can I understand it you know, meaningfully. Uh, but it's very dangerous to hold down belly stuff. I, I'm talking about this in terms of when we do feel aggression. It's very dangerous to deny it. I did a chart recently of, 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 a, of a woman who had this showed up very, very clearly in her chart. She had uh, Mars and 29 Cancer in the 11th house of groups, organizations. She had Jupiter in 6 Taurus in the, in, in the ninth. This is a square. It's, it's a little bit out of sign, but it's a square. And she had... No, I meant moon here. Yeah, I do mean moon here. And Mars in uh, three Scorpio in the third. Okay, that works, doesn't it? This is a T-square. Moon squared Jupiter squared Mars. Moon in the 11th, Mars in the third, Jupiter in, in the ninth. What happened was that she, she lives in a spiritual commune. Okay? She, 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 she uh, lives in a spiritual community and she's been following a guru for, for a very long time. And she was tr always trying to act from higher understanding. She thought, well, I meditate a lot. Why shouldn't I be understanding? I should, I should be above things. And so she was suppressing that Mars and Scorpio. And it was the whole time that Pluto was coming, is coming over it, yeah? Pluto's been in it. And so she kept holding down what was in her belly. And what's happened now is she's developed a very bad case of fibroids. Okay, something kept growing. Something kept festering. You know. uh, I don't think we, we have to act out our belly stuff, but I think we have to accept it's there. Because until you, unless you accept it's there, there's nothing you can do with it. You can't transform anything you're condemning. It, it's clumsy to try to transform something you're condemning. Once it's accepted, then it can be worked with and shifted. So I'm not saying act it out. It's almost like accepting it's there, bringing it up into your awareness, containing it, holding it until you can shift it or redirect it in some way. Let me, let me leave you with a story about this. There's, um, there was a play on television called Duet for One. Are you familiar with this? It was, uh, it was on television. It was a West End play. And it was with Francis Delatour. She did a beautiful job. She played a woman who was stricken down with multiple sclerosis. And she was a violinist. And she got this illness. And she couldn't play anymore. She got multiple MS and she couldn't play. And the, the play is about her therapy, her going into analysis about her condition. And uh, she goes into therapy because her husband tells her she should. And in the first scene, her first session, she wheels, she's in a wheelchair already, and she comes into the therapy session. She's in a wheelchair, but she's very erect. She's very up here about the whole situation. And she says, listen, doctor, I know it's a jog, I have this illness, but I figured it all out. I know what I have to do. Uh, I can't be a baby about it. I have to, I'm going to take on students, I'm going to help my husband, and my life will still be meaningful. So she's got it all in a framework, and she's kind of in her head about it. And for a minute you think, gee, how noble. And for a minute I thought, gee, she's really together. She doesn't need therapy. Look how well she's figured this out. But the doctor doesn't buy it. The analyst doesn't buy it. And in the next five or six sessions, he proceeds to break her down. Until by the fifth session, she is literally collapsed on the floor in a rage. She's totally unleashed. She's screaming about uh, how awful it is she's sick and how could it happen and how much she hates the world. And she's also screaming about when she was nine years old and her father wouldn't let her play the violin because she had to work in a chocolate factory. So any time she was blocked is coming up. The belly again, bringing up any time you're blocked. And, and what, what happens at that point is very interesting because it's when she is the most in her gut, when she is the most unleashed, when she is the most collapsed, it's at that point that the analyst says, okay, now we are going to talk about you taking on students and you helping your husband. He brings her back to what she had kind of intended to do and figured out in the beginning. But it's only now when she's contacted the, the, the energy deep in her belly that she has the energy needed to shift. She has something to shift into this next stage. 
Before that, the whole idea of uh, taking on students and helping her husband was, was being used to hold down what she, was, what she was really feeling. And she never did it. During the whole time, uh, she never did it. Because there was no energy to do it. All her energy was being used holding things down. It was only when what was down there was accepted that she had something to shift. So it doesn't mean acting it out. It means accepting it. And acceptance allows the healing magic to work by holding it. And then you can transform the energy. You can free it from the form it's in and redirect the energy in some other way. So if you deny Mars in yourself because you're afraid of the more negative sides of Mars, you are in danger of losing touch with that bit of you which wants to grow into what you are. And if you deny Mars, you not only become depressed and ill and bottled up, but you also commit the fourth cardinal sin, which is known as Akadi or sloth, the sin of sloth, which, is, which has been interpreted as the sin of failing to do with your life all that you know you could do. I'll end with a quote from Maslow. He says, If the essential core of the person is denied, he gets sick, sometimes in obvious ways, sometimes in subtle ways, sometimes immediately, sometimes later. Every falling away from our core, every crime against our nature, records itself in our own unconscious and makes us despise ourselves. So it's through Mars we express who we are. And ultimately, it's, it's up to you to make good use of your Mars. And it's up to you to make of yourself what you're meant to become. I'll shut up.